And so the focus of the lecture today is the importance of Alchi Monastery. So why I think Alchi Monastery is important. Some of that we already got uh, in the last uh, session when we talked about uh, the mandala and the development of the mandala. And, and we ended that session essentially with Alchi uh, to indicate that there is still kind of an interpretative process going on that you can see uh, in the arrangement of the mandala there. And I think kind of more broadly, it's important to keep this development of concepts around the mandala in mind, uh, simply because for, uh, for early Tibetan uh, art, for the art of Dunhuang, for, uh, uh, let's say, early esoteric Japanese Buddhist art or Indonesian Buddhist art, uh, simply because each of them is a kind of interpretative or a representative of an, a process of interpretation. Yeah, and an interpretation that, that links the uh, back to the Tantra. And we know very well from all attempts that we tried that we can never really uh, yeah, say, you know, that this depiction is clearly, or, or that all aspects of that depiction are actually found in the, in the original root Tantra. It, it always needs a, a kind of translation process that, of course, in the most cases happened orally, but it is also very clear that there were many more textual commentaries that, than we, we have uh, today, also in a Tibetan context, probably also in Tibetan language, maybe some uh, uh, will come up. And Aichi is, in fact, uh, a very important site in, in that sense to indicate <laughs> that this is in fact the case. Yeah. And so I kind of more recently spoke about Archie, I think twice, and about the, the new research I did <laughs> uh, for uh, the book publication that I'm working on. But uh, so what I talked today about is, is slightly different and kind of links up to the mandala concept. Uh, there is a lot of, of uh, yeah, more iconographic details in a certain way. And so we go in, into greater detail of certain aspects of it, but uh, I want to view it in terms of the, the broader historical uh, importance. And of course, one of the, 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 the points that I have emphasized in, in terms of importance is this um, kind of translation process that is uh, visible with the mandalas, for example. And I used um, the end of the last uh, lecture to show this example, that if we have to imagine a, a two-dimensional painting of the three-dimensional configuration in the Alchi Dukang, it would probably look so, something like the Vajradhatu Mandala on the left, yeah, in kind of the more traditional form, so to speak. While that of the Sumtak that uh, is just one generation later than the Dukang and made uh, by a priest of the same family or, or initiated uh, by the priest of the same family, then has an, an entirely different concept of the Vajradhatu Mandala uh, yeah, that, that essentially is influenced by the highest yoga tantras. And so when I say Alchi is at the threshold, it's exactly the, uh, that uh, Alchi seems to date to a time when the predominance of the yoga tantras in the public representation of Tibetan Buddhism was replaced by the highest yoga tantras, or at least the highest yoga tantras increasingly came to the fore. And of course, that culminates in, in the, the Lakang Soma at Dalchi, where you have the full Yabium images. 
Obviously, Alchi is on the quite on the periphery of the Tibetan Buddhist world, yeah, but it's it's and in close pro proximity to Srinagar, uh, much closer than, for example, Tabo uh, that we looked uh, earlier, and I think that's uh, also an important factor in that needs uh, consideration in terms of the the assessing the importance of Alchi monastery, but also assessing what happens there in terms of Buddhism. I already uh, mentioned that what I talk uh, today about will be available fairly soon in a new uh, publication that is a two volume publication that now includes Kapa Sumtek volume and a new volume on all the other monuments, including the Dukan, which uh, hasn't been uh, studied in any detail. So we'll focus on these uh, two monuments uh, through the examples. As always, uh, for my work on Alci, I can rely on the fantastic photographs that Yaro Ponza made in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, and uh, yeah, this documentation, very, very comprehensive documentation, enables uh, to look at kind of many of, of the details. And obviously, that's what we use uh, today. And, and Goebbels' book on IG, of course, focuses on the Sumtek only. That alone is an extremely complex monument. And there are many things that. Uh, one could talk about that in the publication itself. I'm not focusing on the Sumtek. Yeah, I'm essentially uh, republishing Goebbels work because I think for the time it was uh, created, it uh, is of already extremely high quality and most of his conclusions are still valid to some extent. But obviously, there are some changes. Yeah. And obviously, those are indicated in the book itself and sometimes kind of adapted when that was easily possible. But there, there will be kind of certain contradictions between what I say about the Dukang and what Kerper says about the, the, the Sumtsek that I hope will be clear from, you know, from the footnotes that I added and so on. Uh, to clarify them, because once it, it, it would have required a real change of Goebbels text, uh, that wasn't possible, but then, then I have to kind of rewrite it. And that wasn't the goal. It was really uh, the goal to celebrate Goebbels work. Uh, that is by now, of course, uh, 25 years old. <laughs> And uh, the fact that it is still largely valid is, is a stunning fact and just shows how his close reading of the Sumtsek uh, showed or, or led to, to quite uh, interesting uh, conclusions. And obviously, the, the Dukang has been understudied, and there is a lot about it that can be said and that relates uh, to the mandala topic we talked uh, uh, last time about. And it's especially in the interrelationship and in the broader conception that uh, the Dukang is extremely important. And it's if the, the these two main monuments are set into the broader context of the entire complex, of course, one can also kind of gain uh, different additional bits of information of from all the other monuments, in particular the two stupas and uh, the Manjushri temple. So those will kind of be used as well. And as part of that, uh, we in the end kind of established a, a development of the the Alchi complex, uh, together with architects from the Technical University in Graz, led by uh, Holger Neuwirth, who essentially created the plans and through an in-depth analysis of 
the complex as a whole and you know the the architectural breaks that you can still see in the buildings or that you at least could still see in the early 2000s uh, in the building i think the breakup point for the architectural recording is 2003 <laughs> yeah uh, so it's the condition of 2003 one can establish a kind of chronology of the main monuments and here you have a kind of list of the main monuments on the plan in the yeah and one can or one has to consider at least uh, nine uh, separate uh, monuments uh, that belong to the period from uh, let's say the late 12th century to the middle uh, of the the oh the list here doesn't actually go that far this list goes only to around 1220 or yeah because yeah and here we can uh, see in these slides of the plans uh, the the bold sections are the different phases that we now distinguish and obviously that has been published before but i think in the publication that will be much more detailed yeah and much more interlinkage uh, through the monuments itself and i think we came to a better understanding of especially the important phase when the courtyard was uh, expanded of the Dukang. And so what, what you roughly see is, of course, the expansion of uh, the main temple yeah, through the, the two towers, one of which clearly indicates, and I'm not talking about that today, but it is an important historical and, and uh, kind of general uh, religious fact that that tower was used was probably used to store books and <laughs> decorated uh, for that and it had a twin that was later expanded so it's not in the original condition anymore and uh, the Sumzek is an addition to it uh, run one generation later and it's really with the Sumzek that uh, there is a proliferation of construction, yeah, that in of buildings that are very close to each other temporarily, and and the the great stupa, the small stupa, which I now call the Baldendrepungchurten and the Dashikomangchurten, just to give them more <laughs> uh, native names uh, and with some justification, but not with uh, a full proof <laughs> uh, and the Manjushri temple and then by extension the extension of the courtyard yeah these are all happening within a very short time period and these but but a, a short time period within which we can also very clearly see that the means that can be put into these projects got considerably less from the first to the last. Yeah, that means that the, the donors did not have the same amount of money available. He couldn't, the, the paint layer is by far not that thick. The, the painting is by far not that detailed as it is in the Sumtzek, which is really kind of a highlight in, in that respect. Yeah, and it's clearly the the the, the monetary effort that uh, is reflected in that, or the monetary possibilities of the donor. Yeah, and and the the the, the further plans then differentiate this kind of later phases. I won't talk about them. Uh, that are mostly kind of uh, characterized through the addition of Churton. Yeah which probably are simply the funerary monuments of different prominent teachers within the family uh, that act essentially run the monastery. And uh, eventually the Lakang Soma uh, comes into the picture as 
a representative of I think what Soma in this case the 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 local variant for Sarma new me, means or refers to is really the new iconography <laughs> that is now on display in that monument. And so I think it's kind of seeing it in the broader picture is important. And of course, we, it's also important to realize that a lot happened in Aichi in the last 20 years <laughs> or last 30 years. This is a picture of the early 80s. So now it's 40 years already. Uh, there is a lot of, or there were a lot of changes to the complex in that time period. And each of these changes essentially obscures elements that were still visible at that time. And this is, I think, why the, the 1980s documentation of Jaroslav Bonza is so important because it actually kind of still shows us these uh, earlier phase of the monument. And I just hope there's rumor has it that uh, Likia intends to restore the monuments again and uh, also in its interior. And I just hope that this doesn't actually take place because it would be the, the probably the biggest loss of heritage in uh, kind of Tibetan uh, or for Tibetan culture for if this is not done uh, carefully. Uh, so it's so I think to to interpret uh, Aichi, I think one has to consider the historical background of the monument and especially what the monuments tell themselves and take that background seriously because only then, as you will see, much of the details that I explain about Aichi really are the result of that historical background that is obvious from the earliest studies from, from the very beginning, uh, but hasn't been kind of taken that seriously as it should have been. Yeah, And in this respect, I think it's important to mention that the notion, both the notions that it's a monument that relates to Rinch and Sangpo, or that it's a monument that is a Drigo monument, are both misleading because they essentially take away of the uniqueness of the monument. And they, they kind of force one to, or, or, uh, trigger a perspective on Aichi that essentially or, or, or the wrong perspective on Aichi. Yeah. But if you kind of consider the the what uh, Aichi actually communicates through its paintings and through its inscriptions and through its stone depictions seriously, it is pretty clear what it is. <laughs> it's uh, essentially a family temple. Yeah, a family temple of a prominent family of the Zhou clan that uh, kind of created its own monument. The priest, Kalyan Sherab, the founder of the, the Dukhang, was educated at Nyarma, so in the tradition of French and Sangpo, so in that sense, uh, he, it comes in. And uh, yeah, and, and, and then simply is credited with the creation of the monument. The inscriptions, of course, are frustratingly <laughs> uh, imprecise in providing us, let's say, a, 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 a date, for example, of the monument. And this, of course, has been a frustrating aspect for, for uh, earlier studies. And I think this also led to many kind of misinterpretations, mostly following first, of course, that's what I think one is bound to do, uh, the local tradition related, relating it to Rinch and Sangpo. But obviously it's needless to say, Rinch and Sangpo is not mentioned. And, but, but I think this realizing that this is a family temple is important. And this makes it extremely different from Tabo. Yeah, which is a state monument. And it's a state monument in both its foundation, as we can see through the inscriptions and the renovation where the central figure depicted and uh, 
kind of mentioned in the inscription is Chantubu. So they're both from the Royal West Tibetan house. Yeah. Now Alchi very much sees itself uh, and defines itself still in the relation to Ngari Kursum, yeah, to the, the three dominions of West Tibet. And uh, Nils Martin and I, when we met here once, I think two or three years ago, we realized that at Alci, actually the foundation inscription is still there, but hasn't been recognized as such uh, in the Alci Sumzak. And that here we'll gain kind of some more information about uh, the family and the genealogy and it's very clear that it's kind of, or at least for me, I think Niels is of slightly different opinion in that respect. Uh, he tends to more link it to the West Tibetan kingdom. I tend to see it more as a very local production, not linked to the, the West, uh, to Google, but to that, part or that dominion of the three that uh, more or less uh, became Ladakh. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll try to make it a distinction. But what it clearly says is that Siltimer is in a tradition of several priests that, uh, that founded different monasteries in the history, that they come from Sunda, that they, uh, they, they worked for the uh, local royal house and so on. Yeah, and, and so it's not that obvious and clear. And I think Niels had a very hard time <laughs> to try to figure out the, 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 the details of it. And it is an inscription that is, uh, despite my uh, detailed photographs, extremely difficult to read. <laughs> Certainly. Huh? Certainly, yes. <laughs> yes, certainly, yes. So, so there, there, there are things that that are maybe uh, kind of reinterpreted in, in future, but I think Niels has done an excellent job to at, at least provide it. And uh, I think he will also kind of publish the ed edition from it, but I just wanted to point out here it says Tiltim <laughs> Earth. And once one knows that it says that, one can read it, but if one doesn't, one can't. Uh, and it's actually the, the, the beginning of the section that then kind of comes back to him, because the inscription has been, it has been recognized, yeah? Where this part of the inscription has read, has been read, but it hasn't been recognized that it ends where approximately where the beam is and continues on this path. <laughs> yeah. And that this, these are three separate uh, kind of like pages, yeah, text panels <laughs> uh, that are connected by the Tibetan letters of the uh, uh, letters of the alphabet that indicate where you have to continue to read. Yeah. And so it's it's very clear from the structure. Uh, but then would just publish all the text on this side. And of course, the first half is the beginning of that inscription. And the second half really explains what, what's happening on the beam. <laughs> and they're in different scripts. And, and so I think that created uh, quite some confusion in the past. And then, then would publish a little bit at the end as well. Uh, but without any context, yeah, and without kind of realizing that it's all part of the same text. And obviously, I think, uh, yeah, reading this part was challenging and not necessarily uh, the easiest thing to do to even copy on site uh, if the condition is like that. And I think that's, yeah. I think what it shows us is something that is probably very characteristic that the most historical texts are the most often read texts on site. <laughs> and uh, often I've seen that myself, people tend to moisten the surface <laughs> to be able to better read the text. Yeah, because it increases the contrast, but it also, if you're not very, very careful, uh, <laughs> removes the script slowly. 
And I think the only way that we can explain this, this extremely poor condition in an area that otherwise is perfectly, yeah, it's not perfectly fine preserved, but it, it doesn't really warrant all the damages to the text itself, what happens around. Uh, so, so I think there's a, a certain sense of, of it being occasionally used um, that is visible here. What the founding inscription doesn't do is link it to the Trigon school. Yeah, but that happens in the lantern where Tultimo the founder takes refuge to the Trigon teachers along with uh, an entire lineage. Yeah, and obviously this uh, has been uh, discovered by Gerber. Uh, but it hasn't been taken seriously by a number of scholars, kind of finding all kinds of excuses why it shouldn't be taken seriously, but not actually explaining the, 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 the nature of the depiction and how it, uh, or, or, or how, how else it would come about, yeah, how, it, how else it could be explained. And, uh, what is in, extremely important in this respect is, of course, uh, that in addition to the common Kagyu lineage that it ends, that, that, that is represented here, that ends uh, with uh, Pagmutupa in the middle here and Trigungpa, yeah? that in addition to those, you have two teachers that are not uh, represented, usually in a Kagyu lineage, yeah? And so if one thinks that this is, has been painted either at a later period or is an addition and so on, one would need at least uh, to explain that as well. Uh, and, what I actually think happens here is something that we very often see in the Tibetan tradition with lineages, for example, also with Norgen Kyunga Sangpo, is when, you know, when, when a teacher expresses himself his own lineage, he may consider several people in his immediate, uh, among his immediate predecessors as his teachers. <laughs> and include them in the lineage, yeah. While uh, when then the tradition goes and uh, and more strictly cuts it down from generation to generation, <laughs> yeah. Those uh, some of those figures may drop out, <laughs> and uh, we have the same phenomenon with with Guajen, uh, for example. And I think that also happened here that at least in. And I think what it means for me is, of course, that the inscription and the depiction are more or less contemporaneous. Of course, you can always say whatever the whole thing has been added. But here, uh, I think the stylistic and material comparison and so on, uh, again, just don't support uh, that assumption. and. Uh, one of the contributions to the new volume by Rob Linroth will try to demonstrate that by simply looking at the, uh, the details of this depiction in comparison to other details that are spread throughout the, the Sumtek and just demonstrating very clearly how they relate to each other. What has not been known uh, Previously, also is another discovery that both Niels and I made independently of each other, <laughs> namely that in the great uh, stupa or what I call the Palin Jepung Churton inscription now, uh, that uh, the fourth verse was actually misread. And what was uh, is of particular importance, uh, the, the name that is mentioned there wasn't recognized. And, but it is this name that makes, yeah, that, that, that makes the entire inscription work. Yeah. And so even if 
yeah, even even if one uh, wouldn't see the name because it's it's kind of partially wiped out the fact that I have a succession. So you have the homages, yeah, homage to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and then to the teacher, yeah. And that context is clear, <laughs> uh, and it's it's the teacher who is mentioned, and the last verse clearly begins with a J, <laughs> Lord, indicating that it's a person, uh, and the worship, and the gung is pretty clear, or gungwa is pretty clear, and the tree uh, perfectly fits into the space, and with the traces that are remaining from that inscription. So, so even, yeah, even if, if one actually uh, intends to review the inscription uh, in and improve on Goebbels text, I think one should notice uh, this fact. And it actually kind of makes the entire uh, inscription work because now, whenever, now we know that whenever uh, a Rinpoche is mentioned, who is actually referred to. And it's not accidentally that this text too is written by uh, Tsultimö, the founder of the Sumzek. And so I think what we have to distinguish here is, uh, in terms of social context and teaching and so on, that Trigungpa may, be, may have been <laughs> the Tsabe Lama of Tsultimö, <laughs> or at least one prominent teacher he took refuge to, uh, but not necessarily uh, the community was following that, yeah, and and that's at least how I read uh, the evidence today. But obviously, it's then not surprising that Trigungpa is represented uh, in the stupa itself, uh, kind of heading uh, two local teachers, and that in the Dashikomang Churton, that's previously called small stupa, the entire composition of an early trigum uh, danka is replicated yeah, in the local West Tibetan style. Yeah. And so, so I think that part of the evidence is kind of overwhelming, uh, especially with the new inscriptions. Uh, and I hope this will wipe out the 11th century theory altogether, uh, because it's it just doesn't make sense, and it just leads to confusion in terms of uh, the understanding of Aichi. Okay, uh, so now, any questions so far? Nope. So then let, let's go to the 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 dukang as uh, what I think uh, are elements that demonstrate the importance of of the monument itself, and also demonstrate how the the monument is is a bit at uh, the threshold of something new. Obviously, the Dukangs, the main subject is the Vajradhatu Mandala. And I showed that last time that we have only the main sculptures, the Vairochana, the, 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 what I call the mothers of the families surrounding Vairochana and uh, the four other Buddhas represented in sculpture, the remaining figure or remaining uh, deities of the mandala assembly were represented uh, in painting. And then we have an entire uh, set of mandalas spread through the assembly hall to each on the side walls, which of course have been largely identified since long. And I think one of the big issues of creating or writing about this is what what more can one do <laughs> with it yeah and but as often if one actually uh, tries to do the detailed work and actually tries to understand uh, each aspects of 
uh, the representation there is at least some chance that one finds uh, some uh, interesting points. And so we'll just look at it. This is just the, the plan of the Dukang uh, with the apse in the back. That is, of course, the highest part of the building, the main hall in front, and the veranda. But the veranda, as we have it today, is part of the expansion of the courtyard. Yeah, so I think what, what I read differently today is essentially this, I, I link the veranda as it is today to the expansion of the courtyard and essentially the expansion of the space that the Dukang offers. And in this respect, we have to consider how small the Dukang actually is and that it's perfectly in line with a, a, a family monastery. And if we'll go back, it's also perfectly fine to see these, uh, whatever, eight, nine monks, uh, eight monks that are represented in the, the, the donor depiction in the Dukang itself as the full Sangha that was actually occupying the monument at the time. Yeah, it probably wasn't bigger and the, the architecture doesn't really uh, provide more space. And that is, again, it's a difference uh, to Tabo. Yeah? And if you, Uanyarma for that matter. So just kind of comparing the ground plan of, of the different monuments is actually a telling uh, sign that this is, is a slightly different monument despite its exceptional quality. Yeah, it just means that the donors were very rich, had very good connections, and we're probably trading uh, with Kashmir, which uh, is, of course, the most likely uh, in that area. So one of the, the things that I think I found out newly <laughs> and uh, that is important in the context of, uh, you know, the, the development of Buddhism in the region and I think I mentioned already what I focus here on is different from what I focused in the in the earlier lectures that are public that from this year. Uh, but but uh, one element that is important is the 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 fact that the Alchidukang is the earliest monument where we have a Mahakala above the door, as Goppa stated from the outset. This Mahakala has very strong. Uh, kind of at least in the appearance, in the connections, actually, the sadhana that is closely uh, to, closest to the description is attributed to a Kashmiri Pandit. <laughs> uh, the Kartikai that he holds in his hand is essentially the, the Indian type, yeah, where, where the, the handle is not in 45 degree to the plate, but it's essentially along the plate. <laughs> Yeah, or continues in the direction of the blade. And, uh, but that's not uh, the, the, the discovery in, in, in a certain way that was well known. I think what I point, want to point out here is more the relationship to the surrounding figures. And I think here is one of the rare instances where Goebbels' work is essentially uh, misleading through his attempts of identification, uh, because he essentially identified the, the, the lady with the peacock cape as, as Remati. Yeah? But the actual Remati is the wrathful goddess <laughs> on the three-legged mule. Yeah, and again, a very similar deity can be found, and she is the actual consort of Mahakala, <laughs> yeah, or is considered the consort of Mahakala. So if you realize that these two belong together, <laughs> yeah, then it's also clear that these two likely belong together. Yeah, the, the two riders on their horses opposite each other at different levels of the panel, that this is indeed 
And so you have, yeah, that's, that's essentially the pair of riders uh, that would uh, be opposite each other. There are good indications in that respect in terms of uh, the bigger cape uh, goddess, namely the, the hat that she wears is very unusual, but it's actually repeated in the Zoom check for the local donors. And of course, as in the case of uh, Remedy, their heads were once intentionally damaged and restored. Yeah. And uh, it's these kind of distortions through the restoration that uh, kind of you know, makes them a little harder to read in terms of uh, their original context. And so realizing that these belong together and at the same time that their relationship, their res respective relationship is reversed in the Zumzeck. Yeah, <laughs> essentially uh, made me think or, or made me take a step back because what we often have to do, of course, is we have to use later Tibetan sources to identify earlier deity representations. Yeah. But, and so accordingly, uh, the Peacock Cape Lady is often interpreted as you know, either predecessor or directly uh, yeah, because she holds a Vajra and a skull cup. But I actually think she probably is not yet that. <laughs> I, I, I read those in my tentatively as essentially pre-Buddhist or pre-integration, full integration into Buddhism mm -hmm. and uh, kind of provisionally identify her as a Mamo and the writer as a Jala, yeah, as an enemy god in that context. And I think that I do that simply to point out that this assimilation process is still going on and eventually her successor becomes Dorje Chenmo. I think that's also clear from other Western, Western Himalayan monuments, but I don't think uh, we can call her that way uh, as it is in Alchi. And so I think what, uh, what the monument shows us here is this slow integration of, of uh, yeah, local beliefs that, or beliefs outside Buddhism into the larger pantheon. That is still, of course, an ongoing process. And in that sense, uh, these panels are extremely important and obviously they can be linked by, and there probably more work can be done, uh, the, the further panels of Mahakala in Alchi that become, where, where these retinue deities become more and more, <laughs> yeah, it become more and more expanded. But also the condition of these later depictions is not as clear. And so I'm, I didn't really focus on those. And the other question is, can we actually find any text that really allows us <laughs> to identify uh, these? But there's some indication that at least some, uh, yeah, at least for some it may be uh, possible. Uh, but I think one has to think of them as converted and I'll see I can show you another example in that respect where we can actually jump to there because it shows us the same phenomenon. So if we go one floor up in the zoom tech, on the middle floor, we have again a, a, a central uh, kind of wrathful deity, but now it's the six headed six-armed and six-legged uh, Yamantaka that is uh, represented in the center. We have even two peacock cape wearing uh, ladies represented and uh, two more wrathful ones. But what is more important, one of the small additions I could uh, make to the Sumzek is that the five deities, two on uh, the left side, three on the right side that are represented to the sides 
and in between those secondary DNAs can actually be identified as the five sisters of long life, yeah, with their characteristic vehicles and and uh, most remarkably the uh, Decadrosangma, uh, who kind of in later depictions rides a dragon, rides a makara in this particular context. So there's, she's clearly interpret, interpreted in a kind of Indic context in, in that sense, yeah? And so it's, it's the fact that the group as a whole is there allows them uh, to, uh, allows them to be identified uh, in this case. So since I jumped ahead, I have to jump back and go to the next one. So, so I think this, the integration process of local beliefs is uh, quite obvious in Alci, and especially if you compare it to later monuments in the chronology, uh, that's quite obvious uh, as well. And it's very, very different from uh, Tabo, where there is no Mahakala and where all the local deities take precedence. Yeah, the, and there is also a process and we can see that uh, here too. There is of course a process, you, you know, Tabu is of course famous that above the door on both sides from the foundation period and renovation period, we have a female in the focus of uh, among the protector deities. Yeah, in the foundation period, it's called the Menmo. Uh, or Manchenmo, <laughs> uh, as uh, the inscription says, and her name is Vinyu Min, clearly not Tibetan. Uh, and it's clear that there's a strong female component <laughs> yeah, in, in, among the, the, the protector deities. And, and in Tabu, there's, uh, yeah, the, there's no male component in that sense. In Alchi, that changed completely because the rider is not accidentally in the upper corner and the lady in the lower corner. But the lady was still in the earlier depiction considered more important than the concert of Mahakala himself. <laughs> yeah. And so she takes the more prominent position while that relationship was re reversed in the later depiction. And accordingly, you know, the, the movement of the entire panel <laughs> uh, was kind of switched around as well. And so I think, again, it's, it shows a real rethinking of uh, the same topic from, from the Dukang to the Sumtek. And what it also shows is the individuality that we have to expect in, in the monument. Yeah, and, and how individual that interpretation is. And that again, contrasts, let's say with Tabo, because in the case of Tabo, it's the, the iconographic program has to follow the rather, uh, the, the larger state agenda. It's not uh, the high, high priest in a family who can decide what to do in that sense. Yeah, at least there is no indication in that. Or if if it is the high priest in the family, it's the high priest in the in the, the royal family, Changjoke, for example, for the renovation. Yeah. And so I think that's interesting. And that makes uh, Alchi uh, extremely important. Another element where Alchi is extremely important is, of course, in the fact that some of its iconographies, uh, for some of its iconographies, we can't find a textual source in uh, a Tibetan source today in, in, in the Tibetan literature as such. Yeah, and this is most obvious by the representation of this very prominent six-armed green Tara that occurs both in the Dukang and in the Sumzak in an even more elaborate form. Of course, she is, especially the Sumzak representation is almost the signature image of Alchi itself. 
but she couldn't be identified. <laughs> yeah, uh, so so there were quite a few attempts of identifying them, uh, her, on the basis of different uh, textual descriptions. But I think what they didn't succeed because none could account for the attributes the green color in the six arms <laughs> in the image itself uh, but one of the, the you know one of the things i did when preparing for the book is trying to make sure at least that i haven't overlooked anything <laughs> So looking for a six armed Tara, for example, in, in digital versions of the canon. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I uh, came along, of course, was a six armed Tara called Mahashanti. Yeah. They, but the big problem with it was that she is described white. <laughs> and she is one of the, the 21 Taras. Uh, and she is described white. But not only the attributes, but the hand gestures and where the, where the hands are supposed to be uh, absolutely identical yeah, uh, to the Tara that we have represented here. And then uh, if you kind of read different versions around that Tara, you realize that also, you know, her association with the nectar of immortality uh, makes sense and is replicated in the big vase <laughs> with the white liquid inside that is found in Archie. Yeah, and we can see essentially the same kind of emphasis on these vases again uh, in the later depictions of the Sumtzek. So I think what happened here is that here an independent form of Tara that for some reason <laughs> The Tibetans probably decided that she is not an authentic Indian goddess. <laughs> and so it must have been weeded out uh, in the process of canonization that that independent form, or they never translated the text really, that that independent form is depicted here and that that particular end is included in a slightly, in a recolored form essentially among the 21 Taras. Yeah, because that green is the original color is clearly indicated by the fact that she does hold an Utpala and not the Lotus as uh, white Tara would do. Yeah, so usually with forms of Tara, the white ones hold the, the Padma, the green ones hold the Utpala. <laughs> yeah, and, and so in this case, or in the case of Mahashanti among the uh, 21 Taras, uh, the, the, the Utpala makes no sense for a white deity, but it is clearly described as such. And so I think together these different elements seem to indicate that this is not only the most likely identification, but it has kind of a broader justification uh, also in the Kashmiri background, she probably has been practiced in Kashmir as well, uh, because she also holds an attribute that is typical for Kashmiri art and is later misunderstood and is also misunderstood among the 21 Taras uh, with Mahashanti, namely the Tridanda. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the so called Tridanda in the earlier earlier descriptions essentially means a stick with three <laughs> ends, <laughs> three projections. Yeah, it's very characteristic attribute and it's only corrected or, or cor correctly depicted in the earliest uh, forms of Tibetan art as well as in a few Kashmiri and even Northeast Indian bronzes. Yeah, but it's later then interpreted as the Trishula they essentially couldn't do anything anymore with this attribute. It didn't make sense anymore. Yeah. And so it's this uh, reinterpretation that has taken place that essentially has, has kind of uh, led away from or, or 
differentiate what is today a canonical <laughs> form of Mahashanti from what pro probably was an older uh, independent form of Mahashanti that is still depicted in Alchi. And so again, what we have here is the representation of a deity that, that, uh, for which we don't actually have the sources, but we can trace, like by taking the mural seriously, <laughs> trying to you know, understand what is happening around the deity, or, or first of course, the deity's details and what is happening around the deity, uh, that, that one can kind of reinterpret that. that <laughs> Peter von Ham suggested that this is Vasudara is of course absurd. I mean, it's also absurd not only because obviously she is not yellow or yellowish green, uh, that's the shading, uh, but it's also absurd because it doesn't actually consider at all, you know, where she is, what, who the surrounding figures are, uh, how she associates with the five Buddhas above or anything. It's just, you know, reading an iconographic manual and say, oh, this is the closest thing. She has also six arms. And obviously, if one does uh, art history that way, one gets absolutely nowhere. And I think that has to be emphasized here because I found that a particularly bold and nonsensical uh, proposal. And we'll come back to the context in a minute and why she is uh, Tara. For other deities in the context of the Alchi Dukang, we may not even have, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, there may not be Tibetan sources, but there may be Chinese ones. <laughs> And I think this is most likely for the 11 headed, uh, 22 armed form of Avalokiteshvara that in Alchi is again, not only depicted in the Dukang, but even three times in different colors in the Sumtak. Yeah, I haven't really tried uh, to pin that down. And I think Goppa did, uh, you know, he comes from an East Asia site. His interpretations are perfectly fine in that context, I think, for that reason. And so, so I, but I think it's important to keep that in mind uh, and certain way, certain elements and how they are depicted uh, also indicate that. What the 22 armed form, of course, does is that it, it creates parity between the 11 heads and uh, the number of arms. Yeah. And so it's actually a quite logical form of Avalokiteshvara, which has don't, it's not prominent in any form later on. <laughs> yeah, but it must have been prominent at a certain stage uh, and still prominent at the time it entered uh, the program of the two main monuments of Alchi. Even more interesting and intriguing, and again, uh, while I work on it, or worked on the, uh, identification and some of the background, I didn't really uh, follow it to the very ground of it, is the, the uh, when you enter the Dukang, the right side wall, which is kind of the lesser wall, iconographically speaking, uh, represents two mandalas, namely the Savavit and the Shakya Simha mandala, both from the Turgati Parishodana Tantra. The Shakya Simha mandala is more well known or better known as the Nabo Ushnisha mandala in the uh, kind of later Tibet, uh, Tibetan literature. For example, because the, the root tantra uh, on which it is based is essentially yeah, called as an alternative uh, by Putin as the Nabo Ushnisha. And so this becomes kind of a standard form later, 
but I'll try to be consistent and call them after the name deity, after the main deity. Uh, and mandalas are usually, of course, not uh, called by a group of nine deities in the center uh, as uh, in this particular case. But what is remarkable here is these are the two main mandalas of the Durga Dibarishodana Tantra. Yeah. Uh, the Sabavit Verojana Mandala is known, or, or the Durga Dibarishodana Tantra, the textual transmissions is extremely complex. Yeah. And Steven Weinberger summarizes it very nicely for us. And, and he, for example, says that, okay, the, the, the Kunrik goes back to the earlier version that was al already translated in the imperial period, but that the, the Nava Ushnisha, according to, uh, uh, goes back to a, another version of the Tantra that essentially was translated after Alchi. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in, the, in the late 13th century. And so even my late dates for Alchi <laughs> mean that it's still uh, too early, but both in the, in one of the, the, the Yulin caves, for example, and here and in Dunka, we have the mandala already represented. And in Aichi, it is also very clear that it is understood as a kind of in relation to the, the uh, Savavit mandala and that both de derive from the same source. And I say that because one of the puzzling aspects of uh, the Alchitukan was that we have here two representations, the hungry ghosts above and the hells below. Here they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so the hell is here indicated by two uh, demons cooking a bulb of, of humans <laughs> in a big pot. And obviously the hungry ghosts are fed by a local lady uh, and you see the emaciated bodies. These are standard elements of the Durga Tiparishodana mandala. And usually you would have them just around the mandala. Yeah, the, so what you have is the three lower realms of rebirth. So the animals would be here. Yeah. And then you have the positive or either the positive rebirth as a human or the, the higher realms that you also don't want to be reborn because the human is ideal. Yeah, so, so the gods and the demigods. And so what is clear that in the conception of the Dukang, the other two were represented at the very end of the room, framing the both mandalas together. Yeah, and, but this part is completely lost. <laughs> we don't actually have that part, but, but understanding that the mandalas kind of are conceived as together and that there must be the complementary parts on the other side, of course, explains or not only tells us that, that the, the, the Shakya Sima Mandala was fully integrated into the, the, the uh, Turgadik Parishodana context already by the time Alchi was conceived. Yeah. And yeah, and also in terms of identity, that uh, is uh, fairly clear in terms of identification of the mandalas. Yeah, here are the two mandalas together. And in this respect, the Nava Ushnisha is very interesting because it also has an additional deity that is not documented elsewhere, namely uh, Prajna Paramita. <laughs> Uh, in directly on uh, the paddle to the east of the main Buddha. In terms of, yeah, why I don't like Nava Ushnisha so much and find it kind of misleading as a term for the mandala is also due to the fact that among the Ushnisha deities that are usually the ones naming the, the eight deities that surround the main circle, there is a qualitative difference between those in the 
cardinal direction, uh, which essentially replicate the iconography of the five Buddhas uh, or the four surrounding Buddhas and the more Bodhisattva type figures holding different attributes in the intermediary direction. Yeah, so, so, so even that group as a whole is kind of twofold. That Prajna Paramita in this uh, context is no accident, is proven by the Sumtsek, where the same mandala is again represented now in a slightly more prominent position on, in, on the lantern level on the right side wall uh, rather than the left wall. Yeah, and here the it's the typical six armed form of Prajna Paramita that is represented there. And so I'm not. Yeah, that would be another aspect I could talk about, but obviously I published on that, so I'm not talking about that uh, particular form uh, here. And yeah, you see the attributes, uh, held attributes in the surrounding ones. So if we'll kind of zoom out of that one a little bit, we'll see another fascinating element here, <laughs> namely the four surrounding uh, medallions that each of which depict a four-armed form of Avalokiteshvara. Yeah? But only when we kind of zoom in, <laughs> two of them, for example, these are the two on the right side, so complementary to what we have seen from the other mandalas in the Dukang, now we realize that these stand for the different realms of free birth but it's now Avalokiteshvara that is kind of inserted into each of them, yeah? And in the upper one, of course, it's the realm of the animals, yeah? And Avalokiteshvara sits among the animals. And in the lower realm, uh, it's a little bit more puzzling. <laughs> we have uh, Ravana on one side, and actually, yeah, the same forearmed form of Avalokiteshvara, but now essentially in the form of Shiva, <laughs> fighting Ravana. So you have the dev devas fighting the asuras in the form of Shiva and uh, Ravana, and they represent the other two realms of rebirth, yeah, that you don't want to be in, because and the purpose of that, uh, the practice of, of the Durga Diparashodana is, of course, to avoid those gatis, <laughs> yeah, so those realms. And so, so I think it's, it's quite nice to see how innovative these <laughs> uh, uh, details can be, but they make perfectly sense in the broader context of the, the Shakya Simha Mandala and the Durga Diparashodana Tantra. And uh, the same is true, even these little medallions, they are actually the continents, uh, even though, yeah, the interpreter seems not to uh, have been fully aware that there should only be three in each of the cardinal directions. <laughs> There's a kind of confusion and, and that they have different shapes, but that's what uh, it goes back to. And so I think what it, what these details, of course, show is the, you know, the minute differences and how they are actually an expression of this very localized context. And that is very, very, very different from a context that we have later where, let's say, uh, major scholars like Takpa Kjels and Sakya Bandit, uh, Norjen, uh, Tsongkhapa and so on, and, and their disciples essentially finalize and decide on the iconographic uh, representation of uh, such uh, details. And so we, we it becomes a much more solidified tradition. Yeah, the six armed Prajna Paramita, of course, is the subject of uh, separate mandalas in both the Dukang and uh, the Sumtsek. This particular Dukang mandala is just around the corner. So the Shakya Sima with Prajna Paramita is, is on the right side wall. Yeah. 
<laughs> and this is on the entry wall just around the corner. And I'm sure that's no accident. And again, the closest description to any form of six arm, or the, the only description of a six arm form of Bajna parameter we have is in a Chinese source. <laughs> and even that description of her assembly in some ways, yeah, you can kind of link it uh, to the representation, especially here in the Dukang, where she's surrounded by just Buddhas and uh, Bodhisattvas. But, it, but they are no match, they are no clear descriptions. And in my opinion, the variety of forms of mandalas of Prajna Paramita at Alchi is a clear indication that there has been a huge amount of flexibility uh, within and, and interpretation in especially with, with uh, let's say, deities, which later become kind of peripheral. So, so I, I doubt that there is really a canonical tradition for the different mandalas of uh, Prajna Paramita, because the, the variety that we see in Alchi is, um, is simply mind boggling <laughs> and, and very hard to explain. So if we look at this particular mandala, we'll see that, uh, yeah, we have a central circle, eight petaled lotus, and through two squares with uh, it is represented around. Obviously the, the right half of the mandala is repainted due to the water damages that were historically there. So we can't rely on the iconographic details. An obvious case is in the upper corner, there is a Bodhisattva, which I think should be a Buddha because there is a kind of regular switch uh, between Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And so there is a kind of system in their distribution that you can recognize when you just look at the, the, the uh, the right half from the viewer, so, so the left half from the viewer. Uh, so the right half is the original one and it essentially allows us to identify those uh, details, yeah, or, or identify the pattern. And, you know, since I studied on the, on the main sculptures, it became clear that whenever the, you, you have a goddess in the center and Buddhas around, that it essentially has to be Prajnaparamita because only Prajnaparamita is the mother of all Buddhas can actually head an assembly of Buddhas. Yeah, that's uh, a fairly uh, logical point. But if we'll go to the Sumtzak, at the first glance, that mandala looks the same, yeah, in terms of structure. But uh, look what happens in the center. <laughs> so essentially, the, the, the actual Buddhas are moved into the intermediate directions, and the respective family forms in the family colors of Prajna Paramita are placed in the cardinal directions. Yeah, it's again, it's a completely unique the representation of, of that mandala. And it clearly places, you know, the female forms in the foreground. <laughs> and I don't know any other representation of that type. And so this kind of detail is definitely worth considering what it also indicates that uh, the, the Buddhas and the goddesses are considered consorts in a certain way. And this, of course, would be consistent with, uh, you know, the, this emergence of highest yoga tantra ideas within the, the Sumzak <laughs> in relation to, let's say, uh, the Dukang also, of course, then, Retro, in retrospective would have to say they probably serve the same function 
yeah <laughs> uh, but the goddesses are here in the intermediate direction and they are not directly identified uh, with Prajnaparamita. And of course, then we have a, a, a third mandala in the Tashikomang Churton, the small stupa uh, that again shows Prajnaparamita now surrounded by the uh, five Buddhas plus the offering goddesses and gatekeepers in opposition, so to speak, to a mandala that probably derives from the larger Amogapaja context. And what it also indicates that uh, in the context of Alche, rituals of Prajnaparamita were probably used in the commemorative or funeral context. Yeah, because we have the association with Shakya Simha, we have uh, her mandala here in the stupa that obviously is commemorative and so on. So, so I think there's a close link and this I think is to my, to my knowledge also fairly unique <laughs> uh, and indicates a kind of intermediate stage uh, for uh, Alci. How are we doing? Oops, it's already half past. <laughs> Time is flying. So, uh, any questions so far? Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question regarding this very interesting um, shift to that we just saw to the, yeah. to the female. And I was wondering um, if we should really think that this at uh, this concert function and because i mean un until we actually see the 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 depiction of you know of the joining of the two figures there isn't necessarily erotic esotericism esotericism in play it could maybe it could just be again the the generative force female generative force that gives rise or generates the four the different buddha families and now here we have the five deities for the five buddha families and then we only have space for the four buddhas uh, for the families but but yeah because that's the that's the depiction so i'm yeah i'm a little bit hesitant in making the the kind of jump to the the, the real jump to the concerts yes yeah. you may you may be actually right in this in this particular context, uh, to be cautious, <laughs> yeah, because uh, so, so usually what I do, and I was probably sloppy in my presentation here now, is I try to make the difference whenever, if the goddesses, yeah, associate with the respective surrounding Buddhas, yeah, in color, then there is a good indication that it's more, you know, this, what is called the generative power, so to speak, that they represent the families, the female aspect of the family or the mother of the family in that sense. <laughs> and so probably this is more correct to interpret it that way in this particular case, because the actual switch is only really taking place uh, let me see if I can find that. Mm. Yeah, for example, here in the Vajradhatu Mandalas, if we'll take the, the left one, here the first goddess is actually of the color white mm -hmm. and is associated with uh, by Rochana, yeah, and then the others are of the color of the neighboring Buddha, and then the Buddha is is is, is oh, there is only a blue Buddha but no blue goddess. Mm -hmm. So then I think in this case it's completely clear that the 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 concert uh, version has been applied. <laughs> Yeah, because you wouldn't switch them around if it would be just family. 
because for the family concept, you don't need that because from the original conception, Virojana would be encompassing all anyway. Yeah. Yeah. He wouldn't need a concert. <laughs> In this that is sense. very, very uh, uh, kind of surprising, isn't it? Hmm? It's it's kind of surprising, yeah. And there is no. no it's it's not surprising. You, I, I read it as a kind of you know, the a highest yoga tantra commentary on the yoga tantra, <laughs> and, and so a reinterpretation. Hmm. That is, and it's, it's yeah, it, it, it's surprising that it turns up whatever from exactly between the Alchi Dukang and the Alchi Sumzak, and that that reinterpretation happens. But on the other hand, you know, with whatever the link to Dragung by that time, and and uh, generally also the the terminology, the highest yoga tantra terminology that you find, for example, in the Balian Trebung Stupa inscription, there is not, it's not that surprising because that terminology is already completely different from what is pure Mahayana tropes in Tabo, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, I think these, that's why these minute details are actually so interesting and tell so much about the monuments in a way <laughs> and their, their cultural context. And, and so if you would- so much also about yeah, the, the religious history of this region that in that we don't have, as you said, the texts often that kind of give us the background or the text of background for the iconography or the cults that were most popular. But if one looking at this, one can see the, 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 the prominence of Prajnaparamita in various forms, etc., that are maybe lost in the in the textual traces for a reason or another, or maybe they've just not been found yet in all this in in the study of the western canons but still yeah that they're, they're not really uh, familiar to us or familiar in the later uh, canonical literature and so on but looking at this we can definitely trace or see what were the popular cultic forms yeah. uh, of the time so yeah yeah, and that's why I say it's it's important to keep the monument, uh, to take the monument seriously and not try to, you know, <laughs> interpret from the perspective of what we know. <laughs> and that would be uh, essentially a big mistake in terms of Alchi, because you would essentially, so many things would escape one. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Yes, Christian. Yes, uh, it's please, Nils. Please. I had a question uh, about the um, the six conditions that are pictured uh, around uh, the mandalas of the Savadoga Tantra. Mm -hmm. um, the the gods and the anti gods are, are grouped together, which is usual. Uh, but to, to me, I mean, they, they were separate conditions, and so you would need to have there also a Buddha teaching or one Avalokiteshvara teaching. Um, does that mean that Ravana in this case would be a form of Avalokiteshvara or? or no, I think, I, I think Shiva is Avalokiteshvara. Yeah, but I mean, the Sh Shiva is the Avalokiteshvara of the gods. So that would mean that there is no Avalokiteshvara for the anti-gods. We don't care about them or? No, we fight them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looks like. Yeah, uh, but I think it's it's just an expression of of the you know the asuras are always the ones we don't identify with <laughs> mm -hmm. because they are always the jealous the jealous party in the the entire uh, Indian mythology that needs to be suppressed <laughs> and so in that sense they probably don't need in in a certain sense they don't need Avalokiteshvara yeah. Or neither the gods nor nor the the Ravana or the Asuras actually need Avalokiteshvara in the sense of you know being rescued to a better rebirth or something like that, because they don't even know that they need it. <laughs> and so I guess, uh, but it, it's a nice play here to essentially you know, identify Avalokiteshvara with Shiva, and he he has the crescent in his hair. 
to yeah. make clear that this is not an accident. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. and, and let him fight the, the good fight of the gods, so to speak. <laughs> Do you know what is the, the source for this uh, depiction? I know from the um, inside the Manica boom, uh, th there is a conception that Avalokiteshvara is uh, saving the, the people from the six conditions. Uh, but uh, I, didn't know, I don't know whether this is a prayer to the Manica boom or, or not. I would think it goes too far uh, because I think that has a broader Mahayana context anyway that Avalokiteshvara can interfere in all kind of, in all gatis <laughs> in a way to rescue beings. And obviously if you think of Sudhana Kumara as a hungry ghost or stuff like that. Yeah. And so I don't think it needs that, but there may be, you know, the, they they may derive from the same ideas. Mm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't go so far just because you know the Manika boom describes it that there is a direct relationship between that. Yeah, yeah of course. I, I was thinking whether I mean the Manika boom uh, includes a lot of material, and uh, exactly. probably this idea was taken from maybe a sutra or something. something yeah, yeah, like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think you have that already especially in the Karanda view or something like that okay. expressed in many ways. Yeah. Thanks. I haven't really followed that up. <laughs> Good. Any other question before? Uh, we'll... Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I had, I had one or so on the on Dorje Chanmo. Okay. So you, you mentioned that like two things. First, you mentioned that she, she was given at least visually a higher position than Mahakala's consort. So uh, how, how, how do you see that? And the second question, you say that, in fact, it was maybe too, like it was questionable to say that here it's uh, Dorje Chenmo and not like maybe her pre-Buddhist uh, counterpart. And how do you, how to, to, how to say, to decide whether it's Dorje Chenmo already or like a kind of we knew mean uh, we have here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's obviously a difficult question <laughs> uh, because uh, we do have some uh, kind of, you know, Western Himalayan cave depictions, and I refer to them in, in, in the book, that show the goddesses with captions. Yeah, and they give us some idea how they were understood. And there is some indication that even after Alchi, she wasn't understood as uh, Dorje Chenmo, at least in the 14th century, but later on that she may have been kind of assimilated with or actually become uh, Dorje Chenmo. And one thing that I thought in this context is important is the realization that the Dorje Chenmo essentially makes no sense as a, a deity. <laughs> yeah, the great Vajra holding deity is a, a, a weird concept in a way. Yeah, and I think for me it's an indication that this is not a, a name as such, but more a descriptor, a describing name that essentially just takes the Vajra as a sign. And obviously she gets completely reconfigured to a wrathful figure, yeah? which in this early conception, she isn't. And, and so, so I think, and obviously if you read whatever iconographic descriptions from the, of Georgia Chen, more they are far away from, <laughs> the representations that we find in, in the, the Dukang and the Sumzak. And that she may look kind of slightly awkward and maybe semi-wrathful in this depiction is just the restoration. But she probably just had a, as beautiful face as the, the one in the Sumzak <laughs> originally. Yeah. 
And regarding like the fact that she's depicted as higher than uh, Martin? Yeah, uh, regarding that, it's what I take into account here is more the, you know, the, the, the usual sense of hierarchy in triadic compositions that when, when something is depicted to the proper right shoulder of the main one, yeah, that's where the king takes his seat in front of the Buddha, <laughs> that that is hierarchically higher. And so mostly in, in an Indian context, as well as in a Tibetan context, that is a very good indication. And you can use that, you, you, I recommend to at least think about that <laughs> uh, in both compositions like this one, but also in terms of monuments. So, so, so also it's very clear that, for example, in the context of the Dukang, that the, the right side wall is more prominent. Yeah, it's where the Dhammadatu, Mandala, and, and the, the, the Trilokya Vijaya Mandala represented is more prominent than the other wall. And you see that when you then go on to, to Dunka, where the Guya Samaja takes the main wall, the Vajradatu moves on the right wall, and the, 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 the Dhammadatu moves on the wall opposite. Yeah. So, so they very clearly thought in these kind of hierarchies in some form. And so I think it's important to keep them in mind. And so her position is more prominent towards. Uh, Mahakala than the position of the wrathful deity in this, this representation. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why they switched it around. <laughs> you know, the fact that they bothered to switch it <laughs> is, is telling uh, in this case, because you wouldn't necessarily do it without uh, purpose. If you think your uncle was right anyway. <laughs> okay, I think with this we we'll can, uh, I can, I'll talk about a very few, maybe only one or two things in the Zoom tech. Uh, and uh, what I want to point out here is, of course, the unusual uh, structure of the building. Yeah. Now the Palindrebung inscription makes clear that means the, uh, that or, or describes the 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 foundation of the Sumzek and the building of a shrine for the Rinpoche, <laughs> uh, of a relic shrine for the Rinpoche, uh, in the same verse. Yeah, they are clearly two different sentences in two different lines, uh, two lines each, but it describes it in the same verse. And so one of the first questions is, how do we explain the unusual shape and what was it used for? And the Biden Trebung inscription, of course, then indicates that this may well be the, as a whole, uh, the the temple that is supposed to house the commemorative shrine for Dvigumpa. Yeah, if you think of the central stupa in that sense, and obviously the present day stupa is a replacement of the original one, uh, then you know the the entire configuration makes perfect sense, <laughs> and also that the lama is on the uppermost floor and so on. Yeah in the lantern and that the lineage is represented up there. And this is, I think, the most likely explanation for the Sumzak as such, because this room or the, this building could never have been an assembly hall or anything like that. Yeah. And its structure was, you know, a gallery level rather than a full floor and then an open lantern without the floor <laughs> is a clear indication that there is a central element thought into it. <laughs> yeah, that probably even projects beyond the floors, 
maybe we have to think of one of these ancient, you know, high stupas that that we see in many depictions or also see in the Dukang uh, that uh, was kind of originally placed there. <laughs> And so I think alone the, 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 the structure of the building is very intriguing. And I think one has to pay uh, more attention to that. And it, it, it's, it's a very interesting one. And obviously its focus are the, the, the three uh, kind of main sculptures in the niches around. And it's well known that, you know, the Avalokiteshvara on the right side, uh, left, no, right wall. <laughs> uh, is it the right wall? Left wall, left wall, sorry. Left wall from, from or, or the proper right side from the main uh, topic that is uh, kind of in the inscription that is found in the main niche. Avalokiteshvara is identified with Samburgakaya in speech. Maitreya is identified with Dharmakaya in mind. And Manjushri is identified with Nirmanakaya in body. Yeah. I think this is, this makes no sense. <laughs> and is rather misleading because I think uh, the monument very much has been conceived in circumambulation. And I actually read it now more from a more secular side <laughs> with Avalokiteshvara to an intermediary one with Maitreya and the real esoteric one <laughs> um, uh, with Manjushri and the Mahasiddhas. Yeah, and it's that one where the, the donors are associated with. And that I think it's no accident. The other thing I noticed when we, or, or what we know of course now from the foundation inscription is that the, the full assemblies of uh, the sculptures, because each of the four sculptures is associated by uh, four deities. And in the case of Avalokiteshvara, the, the sculptural configuration is clearly identified as an Amoga Pasha Mandala. Yeah. This in turn indicates that there must have been a crazy variety of Amoga Pasha Mandalas with very, very different elements uh, in terms of the, the way. Uh, or different iconographic details in terms of the way the deities are depicted. And that also the one in the Dashi Komang Churton opposite the Prajnaparamita Mandala that I showed before is most likely an Amoka Pasha Mandala. Yeah, even if, you know, some of these iconographies you can't find at all. Yeah. And so there, there must be much more ritual texts dedicated to this particular deity. And neither of them, uh, neither the one in the Sumzek nor the one in the Dashi Komang Churton can actually be explained by the usual extant sources today. Yeah. And so they, they are informative in it itself. And particularly striking is here the Northern deity, you know, shooting bow and arrow and playing Vina at the same time. <laughs> It, so it's just, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. It's very hard to, to find any details in that respect. And, and this is of course indicated as well, if you compare the Amoga Pasha Mandalas from Alche with those at Dunhuang, the paintings that are preserved of Dunhuang, each of them is different as well. <laughs> yeah, and so, so there is a much, greater variety of Amoga Pasha Mandalas uh, that, that existed and Aichi is just one uh, place where that is obvious through the forms. They may also just be kind of local forms. I'm not sure if one can speak of mistakes or distinctive interpretations or even personal interpretations 
uh, in some cases, uh, we just don't have enough in, a, in the variety is too big. <laughs> uh, it's so I'll describe that in quite some detail. The other thing that always puzzled me is why is the green Tara where she is? <laughs> yeah, if you look at the the Avalokiteshvara niche in the usual hierarchy, we would again say, oh, this is the more prominent position, yeah, uh, on the left side wall to the proper right of the main deity. And then Amitabha is in the lesser position. How can it be? <laughs> yeah, uh, how is that possible? And so, uh, the solution to that this is that in the Alchisumtsek, the usual hierarchy between the main subject and the side walls is broken in favor of circumambulation and or circumambulation experience, even. <laughs> yeah. What I mean with this is if you walk into the temple here and start to walk around towards the niche where Avalokiteshvara is, the first thing you see is actually Amitabha <laughs> yeah? on the side wall. That's the wall you face. And the same is true if you walk uh, into this niche, the first thing you see is the panel of Akshobhya. And if you walk to the Manjushrit niche, the first thing you see is actually the, the, the donor depiction. There are just two donor depictions. Yeah. So there it, it just tells you what which donor depiction is more important. But in the niches of, of the Alchisumtsek, it's very clear that the, the right side wall is more prominent or is the more important wall. And the, the usual uh, configuration is reversed. Yeah. And it's reversed because of uh, circumambulation. And then this niche makes perfect sense. Yeah, you have, if you read it essentially from the sculpture of Avalokiteshvara to Amitabha on one side and Tara on the other side, then it's uh, perfect. It makes perfect sense. And in each, each of them, it also makes clear that this indication of, you know, more secular Buddhist uh, worship that is expressed and a more secular character and worship of different uh, 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 holy places in the Kashmir Valley is also expressed on the Doti itself. Yeah, so, so I think uh, reading it that way makes much more sense. And in addition, there is a little Vajrasattva above the head. And there are two protective deities on the side above the panels that kind of form another triad of protection around uh, the whole niche that I think in this case is also important to consider. And so in that sense, the configuration then makes much more sense if it's read that way. The same is true with Maitreya. Yeah, you have on, on the right side, you have uh, Akshobhya's paradise, uh, Abhirati. And opposite that, you have the Manjushri, the Foram Manjushri who in Alche is very clearly associated with Akshobhya and Akshobhya's family, as is also clear, you know, from his, the Buddha in his crown and uh, the niche in, in general. And so I think that explains one of the anomalies that we have uh, in Alche. Uh, then, of course, what you could also do is then ask yourself what are these actually referring to? Uh, that's uh, quite curious that, you know, you have one paradise. Here, the priests and the tantric practitioners seem to quite clearly refer to Akshobhya's paradise. Yeah. But on the other side, uh, the lower assembly 
either refers to the Maitreya itself, <laughs> yeah, or the painting in the back. <laughs> but I think it's more the Maitreya, Maitreya itself, and it doesn't actually have to do with uh, what is represented above. And so again, I think reading this composition kind of in more detail helps to understand it overall better. And of course, then the last point is that there is, of course, no accident then that the Mahasiddhas are Manjushri Stoti if one, as one should in Alchi and especially in the Sumtsek, reads the hymn in, in the sense of the Nama Sangeeti in the highest Yoga Tantra interpretation. <laughs> and that's what I do now. And of course, that's what the Mahasiddhas stand for. And that what uh, Padampa Sangye at the bottom of the Doti uh, would stand for is then the transmission of these esoteric teachings of the Mahasiddhas to Tibet. And I think it's in this function that it makes sense that he is also uh, represented in the stupas. And what finally convinced me of that is uh, the representation of the same Siddha in Shangrong at the very end of the 84 Mahasiddhas. And it's here, it's very clear through the captions that we have that this is the last Mahasiddha of the group, 80 in this case, and that the teachers represented after represent the Tibetan side or the Tibetan continuation, or the continuation in Tibet, let's put it that way. Yeah. And the captions make that clear in this context. And in the terms of the Manjushri niche, this is also indicated by the deity that is represented above the head of uh, Manjushri, which is this puzzling one. And I think I have to more or less end here <laughs> with uh, that one. Uh, if you'll try to identify it, uh, good luck. I didn't succeed, but it's pretty clear that it seems to contain both elements from the Guya Samaja as well as the Dhammadatva Kishwara uh, Kshopia. And there, there's, it's a little, yeah, it's a very unusual representation of an eight armed. Uh, a kshobia that has the hands in the vajra humkara with vajra and bell, which of course the dharmadatu one that is eight armed wouldn't, <laughs> and the guya samaja is six armed, <laughs> and so so it's yeah it's an interesting one and it it, it may not be accidental that I usually you know I'm very 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 skeptical of of syncretic <laughs> deities that uh, kind of take on different elements from different parts and in such interpretations, but this one seems uh, quite uh, that way uh, until we find a better solution. <laughs> and so I think Alchi will keep us puzzling uh, also into the future in some of these details. But each of these details contributes to a better overall understanding of the monument. <laughs>